Welcome to Policy for the People, a show that explores the public policies that can lift up all Oregonians. This show is a collaboration between KMUZ Radio and the Oregon Center for Public Policy. I am your host, Juan Carlos Ordonez. Last month saw yet another record in terms of the fortunes held by the nation's super rich. In July 2024, the roughly 800 billionaires in the U.S. were collectively worth about $6 trillion, the highest amount ever, according to an analysis by Americans for Tax Fairness. These 800 billionaires together have wealth that exceeds, and by a lot, the combined wealth of the bottom half of all households in the U.S. The analysis by Americans for Tax Fairness also showed that the wealth of billionaires has more than doubled since the enactment of the massive Trump tax cuts in 2017. Officially known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, this tax package was heavily skewed in favor of the rich. But many of these tax provisions are scheduled to expire in 2025, creating an opportunity to set a new course. In light of these developments, it seemed like a good time to replay a prior episode of Policy for the People examining the need to tax extreme wealth. In August of last year, Bob Lord joined us to discuss why taxing the rich is essential in order to shrink inequality and save our democracy. Bob is the Senior Advisor on Tax Policy for Patriotic Millionaires, as well as an Associate Fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. Here's our conversation with Bob Lord. So, Bob, why don't we begin by you sharing a little bit with us about patriotic millionaires, as well as about your background, how you became involved in tax policy? Sure. Well, we'll start with the patriotic millionaires. We're an organization of wealthy individuals who believe that the rich have to be taxed more uh, in this country. And the, the organization was formed around three principles. Uh, one is a truly progressive tax system. The second is a livable minimum wage. And the third is equal political participation. My career uh, was mostly as a tax lawyer. Um, I ran for Congress in 2008. And the issue that motivated me the most was, was inequality. My campaign was ultimately unsuccessful. But I started to focus a lot at that point on kind of the intersection between our tax law and inequality. A couple of years after that, I became affiliated with the Institute for Policy Studies uh, and began uh, writing and trying to, to, to do as much work as possible to promote the idea that we absolutely have to increase the, the taxation of, of the very wealthy. Uh, and then in 2022, I joined the Patriotic Millionaires. So when we hear debates about tax policy, particularly around the need to raise taxes on the rich, the argument is often framed as we need to raise taxes on the rich in order to raise revenue to pay for schools, health care, and so on. You argue that this is incorrect. What, in your view, is the main reason why we need to raise taxes? on the rich? We need to raise taxes on the rich to address what's really a a, a horrific concentration of wealth in this country. Uh, There's a very famous quote from uh, Justice Brandeis uh, that goes, I think uh, we can have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of very few, but we can't have both. And we have succeeded over the last 40 years uh, in basically in recreating the concentration of wealth that existed at the, the height of the Gilded Age. You know, folks don't pay that much attention to the size of some of these billionaire fortunes. But someone with, with wealth of $200 billion dollars if you were born uh, at the time uh, Columbus uh, sailed to America and you had had increased your wealth by a million dollars every single day since then and somehow managed to live for 500 plus years, you would actually have a little bit less wealth than Elon Musk. It's just staggering. 
And we have these few fortunes that are far beyond any significance for the goods and services they'll buy. And if they're significant only for the amount of power they will buy and, and, the, and the power they do buy. To what extent have then changes in the tax system over the past few decades fuel this rise in wealth inequality that you just described? They're probably the single most, the single largest contributing factor to it. There are other things. Uh, you know, the organized labor has been dramatically weakened over the last four decades. Antitrust uh, laws have been weakened by court decisions over the last four decades. But the really big one is the the, the very wealthy spend only a tiny fraction of what they have on living expenses, unlike the vast majority of the rest of us who use most of our incomes to pay for pay the cost of living. So the only way to to constrain the buildup of their wealth is if they're sufficiently taxed, because that's their only real cost. And beginning in really beginning in the late 70s, but accelerating dramatically during Reagan's term, the taxes on the very wealthy were just slashed. Uh, we went from uh, a, top, a top tax rate of 70% when Reagan took office to, for a, a while, only 28% after the 1986 Tax Act. The rate of tax on corporations, most of the profits of which ultimately flow to the very rich, has dropped dramatically. The taxation of, of estates and inheritances has fallen off a cliff. And the, the, the creativity of tax avoidance planners, and, and I worked in this area for a while, so I'm familiar with it. The creativity of, of tax avoidance planners in the estate tax area has allowed even billionaires to pass their entire estates to their descendants free of tax. Uh, so it's you you can't you, you it wouldn't be possible to overstate the role of uh of, of tax leniency towards the rich and this buildup of of gigantic fortunes and i know that you've done some research into the way that one particular billionaire phil knight uh, oregon's wealthiest individual has done estate tax planning in such a way as to avoid large amount of taxes. Can you describe a little bit about what your research uncovered? I'll start out by saying I don't condemn Phil Knight uh, for, for his tax planning. I think he just was playing the hands of cards that Congress dealt him. He did something that probably uh, the great majority of folks with wealth uh, that uh, at his level uh, are doing as well. Clever lawyers have developed uh, several strategies uh, to minimize or even completely avoid billions of dollars of, of estate tax. And I was able to go through the securities filings that Bill Knight and his son Travis had made with the Securities Exchange Commission of transfers of stock of Nike, where most of the, the Knight family wealth is held. And I was able to kind of re reverse engineer uh, a big part of Phil Knight's estate plan. And it was fascinating because each of the, the major uh, estate tax avoidance vehicles was featured in his estate plan. The, the centerpiece, of, of Mr. Knight's uh, estate tax avoidance planning is something called a grantor retained annuity trust. And I don't want to bore people with the, the details of it, but it basically allows billionaires to use a, a, a special kind of trust to transfer huge amounts of wealth, kind of if done systematically, huge amounts of wealth into trusts for their descendants. And this this loophole was kind of blown open in the year 2000 by a court decision uh, in favor of the taxpayers 
who had who had used one of these grantor retained annuity trusts. Now, the court decision happened to uh, to involve the Walton family, but that's 23 years ago, Juan Carlos, and Congress has done nothing so far to close this loophole. Ten years ago, uh, the lawyer who was, at least for the Walton family, the one who thought up this strategy, estimated that well over $100 billion of estate tax had been avoided using this strategy. I think he probably had the number low at the time, but certainly by now, that number is it's probably north of half a trillion dollars of, of, of estate tax that has been avoided through this. And I think the significance of that is not so much that it's half a trillion dollars that could have been raised as revenue uh, to, quote, pay for things, because we really have the unlimited ability to pay for things anyhow, just by issuing treasury bonds. The significance is that that's $500 billion uh, still lodged in the fortunes of these huge, hugely wealthy families. And those fortunes are just continuing to grow. And as they grow, more and more power is being concentrated in these families. And it, it becomes, Juan Carlos, a vicious cycle where the wealth is, the, their wealth grows, and then they use the wealth to make the laws and regulations more favorable to them. Are there other dangers or harms that flow from such vast inequality? You already described the impact in our on our democracy and the ability of the powerful to rig the rules in their favor. But what other harms flow to ordinary folks from such vast inequality? Well, it hurts the economy. There's this myth out there that, well, you cut taxes on the rich and they're the job creators. No, they're not the job creators. The job creator is consumer demand. People having money in their pockets to buy things. And when we allow this wealth and, and income from the wealth to flow into the pockets of the very rich, who basically use it to chase speculative investments, or like I said, to, to buy power, uh, that means that wealth and that income is, is not in the hands of folks who would be out there buying goods and services. Uh, so it really, it really chokes the economy uh, to have this, this really obscene level of inequality. So my colleagues at the Oregon Center for Public Policy and I do talk about the need to raise taxes on the rich so that we can generate the revenue needed to pay for essential public services like schools, libraries, healthcare. There's a big difference between fiscal policy at the state level than at the federal level, right? States are constrained in their budgeting. They have to, they do have to raise revenue from taxes and fees and, and whatever, uh, and to use that revenue to pay for things like schools and firefighting and so forth. The federal government doesn't have that restriction. Um, the, the, the federal government can, can issue treasury bonds and pay for things that way. States don't have that kind of flexibility. And we, we need to have it this way at the federal level because those treasury securities that create liquidity in the national economy and in the, the global economy. You know, the, the dollar is the primary reserve currency of the world, and that's a really good thing for America. And as the world's economy expands, more foreign uh, foreign governments need to be able to hold higher levels of treasury securities. It, it, there's kind of a proportionality to it. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Policy for the People. And in this episode, we are replaying an August 2023 conversation with Bob Lord, a senior advisor on tax policy for patriotic millionaires. 
and we're discussing why taxing the rich is essential in order to shrink inequality and save our democracy. So let's switch gears uh, and talk about how we should go about taxing the rich. What do you think are the most important changes to our tax system that we need to enact? You can look back to when we sort of got it right shortly after World War II, or really during World War II, we had high tax rates at the top. Uh, and all the way through the 1970s, the share of the nation's wealth held by uh, the very rich declined significantly during those decades. The rich were doing very, very well all the way through, but it was much, much less than it was during the Gilded Age. But I kind of think that we sort of got lucky uh, in that we had some taxes that weren't really geared towards the the goal of limiting the concentration of wealth, limiting inequality, but nonetheless accomplished it. I sort of liken it to walking around the block to get to your neighbor next door neighbor's house. You can get there, but a lot of wrong, a lot of things can go wrong along the way. It's a lot better to just walk next door. And what I mean by that is, from the perspective of the super rich, we have all this, this, these men, this menu of taxes, and we sort of hope that they magically get to the right result in terms of how much the wealthy are being taxed. But I think the better way to do it would be to have tax that is geared to one of three things, their level of wealth, the level of their increase in their wealth, or the transmission of wealth, which would be a tax on, on an estate or on an inheritance. Look at our income tax rate. We call it an income tax, but it doesn't tax economic income. It taxes what we define to be income in our tax code. You know, if if you and I each purchase Amazon stock and it goes way up in value, and at the end of the year, you sell your Amazon stock and I hold on to mine. Well, we each have the same economic income. We our wealth grew by the same amount. But you're paying, you have you have income for tax purposes because you sold your Amazon stock, and I don't have income for tax purposes because I held on to mine. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, they've had humongous increases in their wealth, real economic income, but haven't paid a dime of tax on it unless and until they sell their Amazon stock uh, or their Berkshire Hathaway stock. And we don't have any taxes on wealth um, other than local, state, and property taxes. And there it's not even on wealth because, you know, like you have a house and it's worth, you know, $300,000, but you have a $250,000 mortgage. Well, you pay tax on $300,000, but if a richer person owns that $300,000 house outright, they only pay tax on $300,000. So you're paying tax the same tax on 50,000 of wealth as they're paying on 300,000. And we do have uh, a state and a state tax system, but it's, it, it's completely moribund. It's just not functioning at all. So I think we need to move from the current set tax system to one that actually taxes real economic income, in other words, the growth of wealth, the wealth itself, or the transmission of wealth, or some combination of the three to get to where we want to be in terms of how much we limit this, this concentration of wealth. At least in terms of a tax on wealth itself, you one of the arguments you hear against such a tax, such a wealth tax, is that it's unconstitutional because the U.S. Constitution has an apportionment rule which requires that certain taxes be allocated among the states according to the population. And I know that many, maybe most legal scholars disagree and say that a wealth tax is indeed constitutional. But as we all know, we have in place a very conservative Supreme Court, Supreme Court majority that often sides with business interests and the powerful. 
So there's a real concern that this particular Supreme Court would strike down a wealth tax, regardless of what the case law and history may say. So for those of us who would like to see a wealth tax in place, how do you think we should approach this issue of the constitutionality of a wealth tax? Well, I'll make it a little more complicated one, Carlos, because the Supreme Court just agreed to hear a case called Moore versus United States, which was a challenge to the imposition of a tax under the Tax Cuts and Justice and Jobs Act, where folks were paying are required to pay tax on their share of earnings of a foreign corporation, whether or not those earnings are distributed. And there's a fear uh, that the reason the Supreme Court grant they decided to hear this case uh, is not so much because they care about that case, but because they want to preemptively declare wealth taxes and taxes on on unrealized income, you know, that the gains in the Amazon stock that you have that you haven't sold yet, that they want to use it as an occasion to preemptively state that those taxes would be unconstitutional. But the way I see it is it's not productive to say, oh, the Supreme Court might declare this unconstitutional. And we don't even know what the composition of the Supreme Court will be when a case finally got to the Supreme Court if one of these taxes were enacted. So it's really speculative. You know, if something's obviously unconstitutional, it would be unethical for Congress to to enact it, knowing it's unconstitutional. That's not the case here. The the, the arguments saying that it is constitutional, as you referenced, are, are as strong or stronger than the ones saying it, it's unconstitutional. So it seems to me that the appropriate course of action is to do what uh, do what's necessary, uh, in, what's in the best interest of the American people. And if the Supreme Court then strikes the tax down as unconstitutional, uh, we'll have a decision to make at that point, whether to let that ruling stand or whether we do what we did when the Supreme Court struck down the income tax as unconstitutional, as it did in the late 1800s, and we amend the Constitution. Yes, amending the Constitution is hard, but, you know, at some point, something will happen where it's important enough to go ahead and amend the Constitution. And I think, I really think there's, there's a moral imperative operating here that we have to do something about, about the, the, the increasing concentration of wealth. Because Brandeis had it right. Uh, if we allow more and more wealth to be concentrated into the hands of very few, we'll lose our democracy, and we're already in the process of seeing that happen. If you look at what these billionaires are doing, where they're buying off Supreme Court justices, they're buying politicians right and left, we're staring into the abyss, and we need to do something. Besides pursuing a wealth tax, uh, what else do you think we should be looking at in terms of taxing the rich, uh, should we look at raising income taxes on the rich as well? What what else should we be trying to move forward? I think certainly we need to we need to restore the progressive income tax code that we used to have. Uh, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, uh, income tax rates would rise throughout the economic scale. What happened with Reagan, and, and it's continued this way, uh, is that the policy decision was made to stop increasing tax rates once you got up to basically the bottom of the top 1%. So the doctor and the law and lawyer who, you know, they're doing well, they're flying first class, but they're not they're they're not buying politicians. Those folks are saying paying the same top marginal rate as you know bill gates and so we need to restore that pro progressivity throughout the uh, throughout the, the the economic scale where 
at, at, at you know at levels of income of you know fifty million dollars and a hundred million dollars of income that those top rates are up there at eighty and ninety percent. We we do need to restore that. We also had just have have horrible loopholes uh, in the tax code where what really is income uh, is offset by bogus deductions. So we have all these loopholes like that, Juan Carlos, that that really need to be closed. But I think in 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 the end, uh, you know, that's just part and parcel of doing a better job of taxing real economic income. What do you think needs to happen to actually bring about change? What do you, what needs to happen for the nation to finally decide to tax the rich? in a big way that can really curb inequality? You know, what has to happen is people need to understand how damaging it is. And we already have a bunch of folks who do get it. We have to change the percentages a little bit at the margin. You know, we have to get uh, another five or 7% of the population to understand what's, what's, what's going on here. The, the patriotic millionaires have this project they call the Great Economy Project. And what it does, what they're doing is going into small, mostly conservative towns and doing kind of a combined uh, listening and education program where we get folks together uh, and, you know, have, and the idea is to talk only about the economy, not to talk about, you know, guns or abortion or anything like that, but only about money and 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 talk about what's happening in our tax system, what's happening with wages, what's happening with, with CEO compensation, where we used to have uh, CEOs making, say, 20 times as much as the average worker, and now they're making over 300 times what the average worker does. And so far, the reception has been really good to the point where, where, where folks' minds are changing uh, and they're becoming actively engaged. I think that I think we can make enough progress to get enough progressive politicians elected that, that we can change things. And look, we succeeded before, and that's what the New Deal was about. Do we need some horrible thing like the Great Depression to happen? Before we get there, let's hope not. Let's let's give it a try before that. Well, Bob, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. That was Bob Lord of Patriotic Millionaires discussing why taxing the rich is essential in order to shrink inequality and save our democracy. Since our conversation with Bob, the U.S. Supreme Court issued a ruling on the case that he mentioned, Moore versus United States a case that many feared would be used to declare a wealth tax unconstitutional. But in June of this year, the Supreme Court issued a narrow ruling in Moore v. United States, upholding the legality of the tax at issue in the case, avoiding for now the question of the constitutionality of taxing wealth. That's it for today's show. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.